Ladies and gentlemen, friends, good morning. I'm truly honored to stand here in front of such a great group of friends, colleagues, and electoral leaders from throughout the world. I and IFES would like to thank the AWEP leadership and all of you for this opportunity. I've carefully listened to all the excellent presentations that have been made the past days, and I will try to do my best to speak in extent of these. I am a self-declared technology geek. I own probably every gadget I can have my hands on. So I am not particularly technology hostile. I am just a skeptic of what we can expect from technology. In my 20-something years of traveling for elections worldwide, I have led, assisted, and observed major technology projects being implemented. I have been the proud participant of success, and I have suffered in failures. It has been a sobering journey, and I would like to share a few thoughts with you on why we think traditional thinking and approaches are fundamental to a successful and gradual implementation of electoral technologies. This all in the overarching shared pursuit of more effective and more trusted electoral processes and outcomes. For decades, many have hoped that technology would offer a revolution in how elections are conducted. How often have we not talked about how wonderful it would be if we could do safe elections directly on our handheld devices and meet all the important standards that we try to adhere to. Replacing traditional paper-based approaches, it was believed would present a dramatic improvement in voter identification, faster and easier voting and result, higher accuracy, increased transparency, integrity and public trust, and indeed, lowered cost. Unfortunately, I believe this promise has yet to be fulfilled. Electoral technologies have proven vulnerable to failure and security breaches, distrust by both contestants and by voters, inflated cost, and to legal challenge. Misperception and suspicion of electoral technology has often proven more damaging than its actual weakness, a fact well exploited by losing candidates, particularly in closely contested high-stakes elections. Electoral management bodies are under enormous pressure to implement new technologies by politicians, by civil society, by vendors, and by the misperception that progress, being modern, equates to using cutting-edge technology wherever possible. Electoral leaders must resist these pressures and let good judgment and common sense prevail. We at IFAS believe that electoral technology can significantly improve the quality of the electoral process. If wisely used to augment traditional approaches, not as an immediate and wholesale replacement of such. We believe that both traditional paper-based systems and electronic systems have significant weaknesses and advantages. Used together, they mutually reinforce each other, leveraging the significant symbiosis that can exist between the old and the new. An EMB should be proud to implement, for example, paper balloting, a well-observed manual count, combined with electronic result transmission and tabulation. Even better if, for example, hand-signed result forms and tabulation reports are made available online immediately for public scrutiny and extensive parallel vote tabulation efforts. The old and the new reinforcing each other. What we know well, what people know well, combined with technology that provides immediate transparency 
and offers the opportunity for our recipients, our customers, the people to scrutinize what is happening. One fundamental discussion, or sorry, one fundamental problem is that the discussion, decision, and implementation of new technology sucks out too much oxygen of many EMBs who have limited time and resources. Not only do many struggle to establish appropriate procedures and training for the new technologies, they also unfortunately neglect to maintain their traditional mechanisms in the flurry of activities around new technologies. The compounding nature of these two factors create immense risk for the elections that we are all responsible for. I believe the last 10 years have been, a sobering, have been sobering when it comes to the opportunities and risks associated with electoral technologies. Now more than ever, we believe that modernization has to be approached carefully. All options available have to be considered. Not just a careful examination of all existing technologies, but also the option to create homegrown solutions that perform better in your national context. And importantly, examine the pros and cons of adopting or strengthening existing or and more manual approaches. Many consolidated high-tech democracies have recently reviewed their technology ambition and decided on staying with or even returning to more traditional approaches, most notably to paper balloting. Examples include Norway, Australia, Germany, Denmark, and numerous other nations. What we at IFAS advocate for is very simple. Solid patient management and excellent leadership when considering modernization and the role that technology will play within this. When introducing new technology, well-proven traditional aspects must receive particular attention. It took centuries to develop processes and procedures that make the paper-based system transparent and trustworthy. Developing similar procedures for new technology is much more challenging, but we often neglect the importance of this. Aspects of traditional approaches that deserve attention include, as already mentioned by previous speakers, a comprehensive legal and procedural framework that clearly lays out what we are expected to implement and that protect us against the failure that often happen when we try new things. Inclusive and consultative system design and implementation Make sure all those involved in and affected by the technologies are taken in, that they buy in to the process, the decisions, the choices, the colossal procurement associated with many of these. Transparent and auditable paper and digital evidence, I think, is of immense importance. And I think we're going to see that in elections that have just happened and elections of the near future. Training and accountability, two things that I consider brick and mortar of our business, but which unfortunately often is one of the fundamental problems we see with new technology. The technology may work, the procedures may be good, but if people aren't trained and held accountable for implementing what they have been trained upon, technologies can again fail. And lastly, and maybe most importantly, building trust through public information and interaction. We often think that it's a no-brainer, the technology we offer, but it is of immense importance that the people understand our choice and understand how what we choose works. Feasibility studies can be structured in many ways. We at IFAS have strived to capture the best practices from around the world in our published methodology for feasibility studies. Key features of this approach include initiate the study with a formal well-published basis for the effort, for example, a terms of reference, 
promulgated by the EMB. Make sure that as you deliberate over your modernization, over your new technologies, that you have a firm basis, the full mandate, and the resources necessary to do so. Convene a well-resourced feasibility study committee with broad membership, including external technology experts, civil society and academia, working in a transparent and consultative manner to build trust around the entire process and especially around the final recommendation. At the outset of such a study, assess the system already in place and the actual cost of this to have a strong baseline to work from to answer the question, what problem are we trying to solve with new technology? And through this, establishing clear objectives, not just for the study itself, but for your modernization and what it is that you're trying to achieve. In fact, what problems, what challenges is it that you try to face? Identification of all potential methodologies and technologies, followed by analysis of all factors affecting the choice, affecting these different options in front of you. Functionality, security, total cost of ownership, required legal framework, EMB capacity development requirements, training of staff, voter education requirement, and so forth. And now it may be a point that rings particularly in this setting, well-managed and ethic vendor involvement, where all vendors have an equal opportunity to make their case. This can include a vendor fair where external stakeholders, such as contestants, are also invited to see and feel technologies available and again build trust around the process. Towards the end of the study, comprehensive pilot tests of two or more technologies in unofficial elections, scrutinizing all aspects of the proposed technology in real life and taking your final decision based on real life scenarios. In closing, knowing how much information you've been bombarded with these past days, I hope that you may remember these three points from my presentation. Electoral technology is not a panacea, but choose such wisely and combine choose such wisely and combine it with sound, proven traditional approaches, you can have a potent solution. Resist pressure from the outside, especially from vendors and from contestants, and the notion of having to be modern. Control the process by tempering it within a mandated, deliberate, transparent and participatory feasibility study. While much is still to become clear, the situation in Kenya reminds us all in this room of the heavy responsibility that is placed on our shoulders and what immense risk we manage for the peoples we serve. Our thoughts are with our dear colleagues in Kenya as they face this tremendous challenge and we must do everything we can to assist them in the coming months. Thank you for your immense patience with me. I and I hope that we can be of assistance to many of you in years to come. Thank you. <clears throat>